was nothing particularly unusual about that sudden 30th, 1945. Subways, railroad terminals, and ferry boats discovered office-bound millions. Women went about their housework and later their day's shopping. Part of this normal life was newspapers, taken as a matter of course by everyone. So regular and complete a part of normal everyday living that finding newspapers on the newsstands, buying them morning and night, was taken pretty much for granted. Never a thought of the rumbling presses that produced them, completely oblivious to the vast transportation system that placed them so conveniently on 14,000 strategically located newsstands throughout the city. No reason to contemplate what life without newspapers would mean until suddenly and with little warning, strike. 1,700 delivery men ceased work. Newspaper trucks stopped rolling. Newsstands formally piled high with eight daily New York newspapers were devoid of newspapers, devoid of customers, barren as a desert waste. With the lone exception of PM, newsstands were as bare as Mother Hubbard's cupboard. 13 million metropolitan New Yorkers deprived of their daily newspaper fare, and this at a time when great events were in the making the world over. President Truman was on his way to a meeting of the Big Three. Japanese cities were being laid waste by B-29s. Thousands of American boys were returning home from European battlefields. Now newspapers were more than a habit, more than a convenience. They were a necessity. Here then was the time of all times for radio, the psychological moment. For years, the point has been argued, discussion has raged pro and con, will radio eventually supplant newspapers? Isn't it easier to turn a switch than to read an editorial? Yes, for radio, here was a heaven sent opportunity. Reluctant to profit by adversity, hesitant to capitalize misfortune, radio nevertheless had a job to do, a public service to perform, and radio rose nobly to the occasion. Newscasters and commentators labored long and hard. Radio news programs were substantially increased. Many newspapers either started or increased their regular news radio roundup. The Times was on the air every hour on the hour. The Herald Tribune had a regular news period. The news doubled its schedule, went on the air 48 times a day. At almost any hour, day or night, the public could flip a dial and hear a newscast. Certainly, if news by radio could satisfy the news-hungry public, radio was giving it every chance. But something was lacking. An appetizer is a poor substitute for a full meal. A starving man languishes on a Hollywood diet. Radio was apparently not the right answer. Newspaper readers telephoned in and discovered that despite tickets, newspapers were still being published every day. Learned they could obtain copies by going directly to the newspaper plant. Here is the Herald Tribune plant on the first day of the strike, showing the truck loading platform used to sell papers in the emergency. The first day of the strike, Herald Tribune circulation plummeted to 15,000. But as more and more loyal Tribune readers learned they could buy the paper at the plant, they went to the Herald Tribune in ever-increasing numbers. On the last day of the strike, the Herald Tribune sold 65,000 copies, by far the greater portion of them in direct over-the-counter sales to Tribune readers who had taken the time and trouble to come far out of their way to get a copy of their favorite morning newspaper. This represents a surprisingly high percentage of Tribune circulation achieved under extremely difficult conditions. Meanwhile, a flood of Tribune readers phoned the paper. Please.
give me more information on the change in red point value. Is it true that President Truman is out of the country? On what troop ship is my husband returning home? Now let's move to the Journal American. Here is a newspaper plant so disadvantageously located for the general public that the paper maintains frequent bus service for its own employees to a nearby transportation center. The sirens of East River shipping convoys provide a musical background for the roar of the presses. Despite its inaccessible location, Journal American readers travel to the plant on South Street in droves. Circulation on the first day of the strike dropped to 4,000. But by the end of the strike, daily sales figures climbed to 25,000. Mirror fans lined up at the mirror plant in mounting crescendo. Daily sales figures are unavailable, but through teeming rain and blazing heat, mirror readers made the trip to the plant, stood in line, made their purchase. The New York Sun. Here was New York's longest picket line. It is impossible to show the full effect of the Sun readership line because the paper was sold inside the building. Sun readers entered the marble lobby of the building shown in the center, made their purchase inside and emerged through the door at the left. When sales got too heavy for the emergency office, boxes were set up in the marble foyer to serve as temporary newsstands. During rush hours, the place looked like Grand Station. Circulation climbed from a low of 23,000 on the first day of the strike to a high of 78,000 on the last day. The New York World Telegram. This plant is located downtown near the New Jersey commuting terminal. The entrance where papers were sold is situated on a narrow side street in deep shadow, untouched by the rays of the afternoon sun. This made it impossible to take color pictures. There was nothing shadowy, however, about the long lines of World Telegram readers who came from near and far. Readers made the trip to the World Telegram plant all the way from New Haven, Connecticut, from the far corner of Long Island. Lines five blocks long were a daily occurrence. Thousands filed slowly into the Telegram building and emerged triumphantly with their favorite afternoon newspaper. Circulation rose from 15,000 on the first day of the strike to 50,000 on the last day. The New York Times. Because of its Times Square location and because it is a morning newspaper, the largest Times crowds during weekdays occurred at night and are not shown here. Blocks adjacent to the Times were frequently choked with readers for a couple of hours around theater closing time. A New Jersey resident bought five copies of the paper to auction off at a Red Cross meeting. When copies of the Times got as far as Asbury Park, New Jersey, although well read by train passengers, they were sold for a dollar a copy if current, 50 cents if a day old. A newsstand manager at Little Silver, New Jersey, was offered a dollar for a day old time, but refused to sell because he wanted to read it himself. Time's daily circulation rose from 38,000 on the first day of the strike to 210,000 the final day. The New York News. For 22 hours out of every 24, News readers poured in and out of the news building two to four abreast from six o'clock in the morning to four the next morning. Lines began forming in the afternoon about five o'clock, stood for three hours to await the first edition at 8.15 p.m. The longest line occurred on a Saturday night to buy the Sunday news. This line, 17 blocks long, snaked its way along 3rd Avenue, back and forth on cross streets to 32nd Street. City police went through the subways at 34th Street, warning passengers bound for the news building to get off there to join the line instead of going on up to 42nd Street. Assistant Chief Inspector John D. Martino of the New York City Police Department said, 
This was the biggest lineup crowd in my experience. It averaged 30,000 per hour. People stood in line for two hours before reaching the counter. 42nd Street grew accustomed to a daily ritual. Passing trolley cars were parked while motormen and passengers got off to buy the paper. Taxis, private cars, the street and adjacent blocks were packed throughout each evening with vehicles while passengers and drivers bought the news. One of the picketers, after shedding his sign, nightly went inside to buy his paper. From 37,000 over-the-counter sales on the first day of the strike, sales zoomed to 915,000 on the last day of which 584,000 sales were made over the counter to individuals in the lines you see. Happily, however, even labor strike has its lighter moment. By courtesy of Movie Tone News, Mayor F.H. LaGuardia reads the comic. Big Tracy. Now here, the first picture is the laundry wagon. It's a yellow laundry wagon. And wet wash, that's the driver, you know. He's uh, very calmly sitting down with his back toward the back of the wagon, eating his lunch. And uh, our little friend, Leading Hub, what is her name? I'll give it in a minute. And uh, she's inside with the money. And she says, when are you going to let me out of here? He says, wet wash says, easy, sister, easy. And then the next picture, and we hear the sound from inside the wagon. Oh, for, no, uh, wet wash says, I'll let you out when you decided to give me a better cut of that dough. From the inside, and we see the inside now. I offered you a thousand dollars. What do you think I am? This is my money. And if you remember, she starts stripping and tearing up the laundry. And she has all of the money in bills in the pillow slip. And we hear wet wash. Listen, baby, I know you're a maid at Van Hoosen's. I saw you there last week. And I know there's something phony about that dough. Now, when we get it, it's going to be 50-50. OK? then maybe you'd like some more of your laundry torn to pieces. Rip! She's ripping her laundry there, and that little delicate piece of lingerie. And he looks in. Ye gods, I lose my job over this. Stop, you win. I'll settle for five grand. Now, get this picture. Here is wet wash. The doors of the laundry wagon are open. He's leaning with his back toward the the wagon, and he's counting his money. Two, three, four thousand. Now he's getting into the hundreds. Six hundred, seven hundred, eight hundred. And the picture shows a hand of breathless stretching out. She's got hold of that iron pot. Remember the iron pot she took from the Van Hoosen's gardener's flat to put the money in? And crash! She crashes it on his head. Knocked out. Hey, children, what does it all mean? It means that dirty money never brings any luck. Thus, New York learned that if the newspapers could not go to the public, the public would come to the papers. During the 17 days of the strike, the public came to the various plants bought a total of 10,628,000 newspapers. Trouble, inconvenience, this was the price paid each day for New York newspapers by long lines of people in rain and sun, standing for hours on hard concrete, risking bodily harm by cutting through picket lines, impervious to shouted warnings of pickets in a city heavily unionized men, women, and children in all walks of life, giving up a summer evening of pleasure or relaxation, going without lunch or postponing dinner for hours, coming for miles in oven-warm subways to stand for long periods 
in halting our slow moving file. Patient, perspiring, persistent, all for a few penny purchase. Such is the miracle of journalism, and such is the significance of newspapers to their readers. Newspapers which can be read and reread. Newspapers in which the public can read all about it in their own time, at their own convenience. And thus was New York's sigh of relief when the strike finally was ended, when within the hour the trucks were rolling and New York life returned to normal. Once again, dramatic proof has been given that no other medium can take the place of newspapers in the lives of the people. And the fundamental reason why newspapers are held in such high regard by the American public lies in that long-cherished bulwark of liberty, freedom of the press. <laughs>